ought to do a quick round of introductions. You first. Okay, so uh, I'm Terry Cox. Um, I'm co-chair of the CDF Best Practices Special Interest Group, and uh, I uh, have been spending the past year, I guess, now working with a great team of people trying to identify some of the challenges in the continuous delivery space and help to codify those into a set of information that we can share with everybody. Uh, and uh, one of those uh, most excellent people is my friend here, Tara. If you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Tara Hernandez. Uh, I am recently Vice President of Developer Productivity at MongoDB, uh, but not that far, uh, not that long ago, I was working in uh, Cloud Developer Relations um, for Google. Um, as Terry said, we've been working on the best practices site framework for about a year now. Um, we had the world's longest Google document with incredibly long comment streams on getting started. And we're looking forward to continuing to work on building out this site with making it a practical resource um, of not just definitions, but examples of various types of continuous integration, delivery and deployment, um, hopefully with a little security in there uh, for people to come and use as a reference. So getting us started, let's see, who else do we have here? Did we get a Justin? I'm gonna pull him in if we did. Uh, Justin, if you're here, give a shout on the chat. Um, <clears throat> So we wanted to start with an overview of the site. Um, so the, the most important thing is we've got the published site and the source code. So go ahead and do a share screen window. Here we go. All right. So uh, here is the site. Um, it is at the moment a work in progress, in case you can't tell, and if anybody has a, uh, a mind towards um, a good content organization and color scheming, not quite sure about that chocolate, milk chocolate color there, for example. Um, we're looking for all kinds of different types of contributors. Um, and as you go into the site, the big area that we have been focusing on up to this point is the learn section. And right now, where, where we're at with this is kind of the overview topics that we have. Um, relevant to the latest research uh, that's going on around the industry, as far as the definition types, tool stacks, and what have you. Um, we also um, have a community site, which we're hoping to focus on for the next year, which is bringing in those external examples. Um, so that'll be an area uh, of focus. Um, and of course, finishing out the site, there are some areas that aren't completely, um, uh, that aren't complete as yet. Um, we have a GitHub repo here uh, where you can clone and do pull requests. Uh, we have a number of issues uh, so far for looking for content development uh, or refinement. Um, that's part of the CD Foundation organization. And Terry and I keep an eye on things and continue to put through changes. So that is sort of the basic overview. Uh, Terry, did I miss anything? No, uh, I, th I think really it's Im important to stress that this is a, a community effort and that uh, lots of people have contributed over over the past year or so um, and we're really here to encourage more people to get involved and um, help to to build out not just the, um, the the basics of best practice but also to help provide reference examples and case studies and uh, a, 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 just a a resource where we can all come to to find important relevant information to help us on this on this journey uh, and i think this is always a case of um, there are people at di many different stages of this journey 
um, and those that have progressed a little further and um, taken a bit more battle damage can hopefully um, give a leg up to those who are just starting on their journey and minimize um, the, the risk and pain involved in you know, any, any new venture like embarking on a continuous delivery process. So we definitely encourage people to um, to to reach out and, and come join the special interest group um, uh, or start providing pull requests on the on the documentation pack if you have something that you think is valuable to contribute. Um, on the community uh, under the community section in the site shows the contribution guidelines. I'm just noticing that they're slightly out of date. Netfly is actually set up. It is how we are publishing this site. Um, I guess I have another fix I need to put into the content. Um, another aspect uh, is the tagging system. It's still a work in progress, but the hope is as the community contributions come in, and we do have those examples that Terry was talking about, uh, we'll be able to reference them back into uh, these categories. So as people are learning about them, they can go directly out to a particular example of that in execution. Okay. So we've got a couple of people in here. And one of the things we were curious to hear about, uh, folks, um, if you go ahead and either, I think you can, you can have like 10 people on the call or if you'd rather just uh, type it into the chat window. Uh, we had some questions uh, around sort of gauging where your organizations are currently at um, as far as uh, the broad breadth of coverage of the thing that ultimately leads up to continuous delivery. So version control, um, actually, let's just do a quick poll. So at your organization, um, put it into the chat or, or request a, a connection. And how many of your organizations have a solid uh, version control story uh, for your dev team? And I, I think one of the, the learning experiences that we've had while we've been assembling this set of information has, has been quite how big the disparity of information, communication and knowledge there is in, in this sector. But even in organizations that are very mature in, in the continuous delivery process, uh, it, it's common to find people who uh, are, are very deep, but perhaps quite narrow in their understanding of the overarching methodology. Uh, and so, you know, one of the things that we're trying to do here is provide a way for everyone to understand not just about specific technical pieces of a methodology, but actually to understand the bigger picture about you know, why we do this in the first place, why it's important and what what business benefits there are from from following this sort of methodology. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and there's a lot of interpretations on some of some of this stuff. So I see we got a yes for, from Nicole. All right, um, and really quick, Nicole, is it a Git-based system by any chance? That seems to be fairly predominant these days, but not necessarily pervasive. On-prem GitLab. All right. Okay. So from GitLab, then presumably you're using a PR-based system, so you've got some form of continuous integration. Continuous integration being specifically uh, around the continuous build and at least preliminary testing per commit. And then does your organization um, also do continuous deployment or stage delivery? And actually, let's talk about that a little bit. We had an argument about what does it actually mean to have continuous delivery versus deployment? Um, that was a fun, a fun PR comment thread. So for clarity, continuous delivery, we are saying is that at any time the software is deployable, may or may not actually be automatically deployable. Terry, ready to argue with me? Or we, do we agree on that? Well, I, I think that's, it's one of those phrases that, that has been overloaded um, many times. And so it, it, can, it, it can be confusing if you're using it in different contexts. Um, we, broadly, within the CDF, we use continuous delivery to mean the whole end-to-end -end methodology, um, which is not 
just the engineering piece, but also the 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 commercial and and business piece that you you need in order to uh, be able to deliver product rapidly change, and continuously. Change management, in other words, um, yeah. is, is a big part of that, right? Exactly. But then continuous deployment means you're actually doing it and pushing your stuff live um, because you have figured out all of those intricacies, which is very hard, by the way. Not a lot of places do it truly. So Cole says, GitLab CI to build, test, and deploy as far as CD, we automate prod deployments on tagging. Okay, excellent. Tagging in this case, meaning the Git tags. Um, so the tagging, uh, is that part manual based on um, a, a policy or is the tagging based purely on the automation? If you happen to know that. Oh, gosh, I can't drink coffee today. All right, well, Nicole was thinking about that answer. Um, ah. Tag manually, I'm not sure we could truly deploy it anytime. Ah, it's all right. Goals. So another um, another uh, question that we that we thought of, and uh, Terry, I'd love for you to take the the lead on this one, which is you know, so there's a certain amount, Nicole, in this case that we're picking on her, um, of automated testing that's in place. And one of the interesting questions uh, that we talked about is. How do you automate testing at scale? So as your organization grows, as the consumption of your services expand, um, uh, at some point, testing can get quite challenging. Uh, I don't know, Terry, do you want to kind of walk us through some of the, the gotchas that people could run into as part of like evaluating this? Well, I, I, I think the, the, the thing with testing is that it's, it's one of those infinite rabbit holes where you, you you can test forever and and, and, and never be comfortable deploying anything um, but this is why it's important to come back to continuous delivery as a methodology rather than just a set of techniques because but if you think about the reason for testing in the first place it's it's because the overarching methodology is saying that we we know that we can never deploy something that is 100% correct and 100% safe. So we know we're always going to have problems. And, and so what we should be trying to do is get better at responding to issues and recovering from them rather than trying to get too focused on making sure that issues never happen. So when you think about that from the perspective of testing it, it it's a better guideline in terms of saying what what should we be testing what's important because you under that perspective you're, you're not trying to say have have we validated every single piece of this application in multiple different ways what you're saying is have we got some really good signals that will tell us when something has changed and things are not working the way we expected before. Can we do that in enough places that we can capture problems as soon as they occur um, and then potentially roll back to a known good position uh, rather than being more focused on a lot of upfront testing and then just chucking it out there and hoping it works anyway. Well, you know, it's uh, it's funny because I remember seeing the memes, uh, gosh, I don't know, four, five, six years ago, where it was, you know, it was the world's most interesting man. He was like, I don't always test my code, but when I do, I do it in production. Or I was like, ah, ha, ha, that's silly, the most ridiculous thing ever. And yet here we are. And that is actually considered, to you know, to your point, actually valid and possibly more efficient because the signals that you're getting are actually the most accurate because they're reflective of the production environment. So then, yeah, absolutely. The what's your response time to failure becomes the most critical aspect of that. Yeah. Um, but I, I yeah, I, I wish I could figure out a funny way to like turn that meme back around because it is considered completely legit at this point if with the right kind of services, right? So you have the, um, Services that just physically take, you know, many hours to redeploy would not be a good cat, uh, a good criteria match for that philosophy. 
Um, yeah, and also there's a um, there's a continuum there in that you're you're not necessarily you're not necessarily only testing in production, but you should certainly have at least some level of smoke testing on anything that goes into production. Absolutely. But and, what and you do need is is to be able to have a an ongoing build and test that is sitting behind your production so that you know that the asset that you've got ready to deploy is actually still fit to deploy. And, it could uh, and this is something, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. sorry. No, no, go ahead. I, I, this is one of those ones where we tend to ignore the fact that code rots. Um, and, and so when we, when we run a, 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 a build pipeline, we think we've got good code, but actually we've only got good code at the moment that that pipeline completed because all the world around us is continuing to move right. and our dependencies may be changing, our environments may be changing, um, and, and there are many things that, that can invalidate the build that we've just done. So uh, it's insufficient to, to run a build once uh, if you're not going to go straight into production with that with that build um, and even if you're in production you should really be continuing to run that build and run those tests on a regular cadence to tell you that you can still build this thing and that all of your dependencies are still valid um, so that if you do need to change something in a hurry you you can get a change through the system at maximum speed knowing that everything is still good to go and you think about something like a a, 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 can, a canary deployment model which you know it's like you if you think about that as both something that allows you to do a big rollout in a um uh in, in a in theoretically a safe way. So, you know, 5%, 10%, 20%, you gradually turn up the dial and then now your big change is uh, fully deployed. You, To your point, Terry, you know, you could also continue to use that where you have a canary deploy on that's maybe always running at one or 2% rate um, and maybe behind um, a further feature flag style restriction so that you really have a special category of people who are always basically seeing your world live, right? That would be a, a truly aggressive, but fundamentally awesome uh, ability to be able to say. And like the, Nicole, what you were saying is that you don't know that you could truly deploy at any time. So my question to you would be to think about, and no pressure, you know, what, what do you think is holding your organization back from that, right? Is it perhaps a, a lack of confidence in the coverage, in the lack of confidence in, you know, turnaround time, so failure to resolve? Uh, or your, I'm sorry, your time to resolve rate. Um, what sorts of things do you think uh, make that challenging? So take your time, give a, give a thought about that. Um, the other thing about testing at scale, so I think, you know, there's what you're talking about, Terry, which is freshness. Then there's like true scale. So a lot of what companies do, uh, Yelp was a great example of this, is they're like, okay, well, you know, this cloud thing is pretty awesome. And AWS has these spot instances and, you know, those are cheap. So we can just test as much as we want. And then the rule of thumb is the tests are as fast as the slowest test. You try to parallelize things as much as possible. Uh, but then you start running into, oh gosh, uh, the spot instances are actually becoming unavailable because the, you know, the tendency of those instances are getting overloaded and, and uh, very practically it's like, oh, this isn't working anymore, right? And then you also think about, okay, well, even with spot, or if you decide spot is too unpredictable and you go to dedicated uh, residency, there's cost management, right? And so there's, you know, how do you evaluate um, the ROI of your infrastructure investment? Um, where's the inflection point to when, you know, you're spending the right amount of money and not too much or too little. So I think there's a definitely an art to that discussion as well. And I wish, I wish we'd come up with a good heuristic on that one. Maybe that's a, a good exercise that someone could try. I don't know if you yeah. have thoughts on that topic either, Terry. Well, I, I was rather thinking that right now the primary reason for not being able to deploy 
is because the business isn't ready. Um, and, and that's where we hit one of the fundamental challenges, which is that if, if you're driving your continuous delivery adoption purely from an engineering perspective, you run the risk of getting stuck at some point because the business as a whole has release processes which sit outside of the engineering space and those might be marketing or legal or a range of different timing issues that need to be sorted out and if the organizations you you're working within are not following continuous delivery as a business methodology then you you reach this um this bottleneck where you're trying to deliver an engineering level on high cadence, but the business is trying to fulfill an annual strategic plan um, and is, as a result, completely misaligned with what you're trying to do at, at a technical level. And so yeah. one of the most important things is to address that mismatch between methodologies at a commercial level before getting too deeply into continuous delivery as a technical uh, discipline. Yeah, that's a great point. And there may be completely legitimate reasons why you'd have variety in that. Like for Mongo, for example, I've recently learned that the core server uh, comes out more annually for a major revision and then quarterly for, you know, maybe some minor tweaks, but you, you don't, we, as a business, we don't actually want to go faster than that because it's a database. You know, our customers don't want to take constant change, but there's a whole ecosystem around that, especially in the cloud-based services and hosting where it's, um, you know, the continuous delivery is an actual, a continuous deployment is an actual goal legitimately because it works well for our business and works well for customers. Nicole says, we're generally disorganized and could certainly improve test coverage. Our entire org is less than 20 people. Aha, you're a little company. That is fantastic. It means that you're already looking in, into investing and doing it right. And so you will be more successful in the long run. Well done. A lot of times companies wait until they have more than a hundred people <laughs> before they start thinking about this stuff. <clears throat> cool. Yeah, and it's definitely easier to to do this with smaller teams and then scale the business than it is to try and convert a large number of teams into a completely new methodology. Right. And I think the important lesson uh, that we can offer you, Nicole, is that much like your product will evolve and your organization will evolve, your, your continuous uh, delivery pipeline also will need to evolve. So anyway. Um, we are just about at the end of time. This was a good discussion. Nicole, good luck with your startup. Very exciting stuff. Uh, send a thank you to Terry for, as always, great conversation. And again, as a reminder, uh, come on over and find us at the CD Foundation on GitHub, the best practices site. Um, and there's also the um, SIG best practices repo, which has meeting information um, that you can join us and nerd out about all cool things, continuous delivery. So. Yep, and I shall be around at the rest of the event virtually. Uh, so feel free to uh, connect with me if you've got questions or would, would like some help with your continuous delivery processes. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Terry. Talk to you soon.